the genes of you and me. Genes of you and me. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, and welcome to the 22nd episode of Discovering New Advances, or DNA, a podcast that keeps you up to date about the scientific world in an easy-to-understand language. So whether you're a student in middle school or a grandparent, you'll easily be able to follow along. I'm Kieran. On this episode, I'll give an introduction lesson about James Watson and Francis Crick. For more information, please visit dnapodcast.com or email in at info at dnapodcast.com. On this episode, we're going to delve into who James Watson and Francis Crick are. Previously, we learned about Rosalind Franklin, who contributed a great deal to learning the structure of DNA. This episode, we're going to change the perspective to Watson and Crick's during the discovery of the structure of DNA. We'll start where the dynamic duo Watson and Crick first started, at the University of Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory in England. The article publishing their new discovery was titled Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acids, a Structure for Deoxyribonucleic Acid. It was published in the scientific journal Nature on April 25, 1953. This was the first publication revealing the double helical structure. This one article is nicknamed the Pearl of Science due to its groundbreaking contents and short length. It is also known as the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century, as it was the turning point for new era in biology. You can read the article yourself. There's a link in the show notes as well as on the website. Watson and Crick did discover the structure of DNA but they used other scientists' findings to build their model. Much of their work was from Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins at King's College in London, who we discussed on a previous episode. In Watson's famous 1968 book, The Double Helix, he revealed that he did have access to some of Franklin's data via a source she was not aware of. He and Crick also saw, without her consent, the B-DNA X-ray diffraction pattern that Franklin and her co-worker Gosling found in May 1952 at King's College. This book of Watson's was not publicly accepted by Crick or Wilkins, and obviously not Rosalind Franklin, who had died 10 years previous to the release of the book. This memoir includes not only the scientific data, but the controversies, personalities, and conflicts that occurred during this discovery. In 1952, Franklin submitted an update on her work to a Matt Perutz, who was in the Medical Research Council and was working at the Cavendish Laboratory of the University of Cambridge. Watson and Crick also worked there in the Cavendish Laboratory, and somehow Crick got his hands on a copy of Franklin's work early the next year in 1953. It was later found out that Matt's Pertz, the man Franklin gave her work to, had passed it on to Watson, as Watson explained he had already heard of her work before 1951 when Franklin presented her work at a meeting arranged by Wilkins, who was Franklin's co-worker at King's College, where Franklin, Gosling, and Wilkins worked together. So because Watson explained he'd already seen the work... Max Perutz said, all right, yeah, sure, I'll show you the work then, since you've already seen it. Later, Watson and Crick then sought permission from their lab, Cavendish Laboratory, to publish their findings, which were based off the work of Franklin, Gosling, and Wilkins. Watson, Crick, and Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962 for their research on the structure of nucleic acids. Rosalind Franklin was not awarded this because Nobel Peace Prize, you can only have three recipients, and they must be alive. Rosalind Franklin was dead at this point. Other than the structure of DNA, Crick was also known for coining the term central dogma to explain the direction of genetic information from DNA to RNA to finally proteins. Crick stayed away from genetics, unlike his partner Watson. Crick researched theoretical neurobiology in attempts to drive the study of human consciousness. He sure was a hard worker, and allegedly he was editing a manuscript on his deathbed. A fun fact about Crick is that his grandfather, Walter Drawbridge Crick, actually worked with Charles Darwin evolutionary biologist, and even published with him. Watson, on the other hand, went on to be the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in 1968, the same year his book was published. There in Long Island is where him and his family settled. He held this title for 35 years before accepting the role of chancellor. For two years, from 1990 to 1992, Watson was the head of the Human Genome Project at the National Institutes of Health. The reason he left was because he disagreed with director Bergenin Healy, on having genes being patented as he saw the genome as belonging to the human race, not particular scientists who identify the genes. And a fun fact about Watson is that he enrolled at University of Chicago at the young age of 15. 
He was inspired to study genetics in 1946 when he read Erring Schrodinger's book, What is Life? He was originally going to study orthonology, which is the study of birds. Let's review before we wrap up. Watson and Crick worked together at Cavendish Laboratory of the University of Cambridge. There they used Franklin and Wilkins work to identify the structure of DNA. Max Pertz shared their work without permission, and based on this, they were able to create the structure of DNA. Watson and Crick, along with Wilkins, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962 for their discovery on the structure of nucleic acids. In 1968, Watson published his book reaccounting this discovery of the structure of DNA, which we now know is quite scandalous. I hope you enjoyed learning the discovery of the structure of DNA through Watson and Crick's eyes versus Rosalind Franklin as we did in the past. If you're interested in learning more about genetics, you can go to dnapodcast.com for more episodes in transcript format and in audio format like you're listening to now. You can email me directly at info at dnapodcast.com or use the contact form, whatever's easier for you. If you have a question or comment or you want me to cover a specific topic on an episode, I'm happy to do so. You can also keep in contact with us via social media on Facebook and Twitter, both at slash DNA Podcasts. Automatically get the show downloaded via iTunes by subscribing, and please rate and review there. You can find all the links I just mentioned on our website, dnapodcasts.com. Thanks for listening, and join me next episode to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics.